This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Welcome to Deep South Dining. Malcolm White with Carol Puckett. And yes, we've had a journey down to Cajun country. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Carol, how are you? Malcolm, I'm great. And I see that you've got a Cajun in your pocket. <laughs> I do. What in the world is this? Well, it's a little uh, pre-recorded six, uh, what they call Cajun phrases. Um, and it's put into this little plastic handheld uh, device that uh, it's pre-recorded. You just hit the button. You gotta suck the head on them damn crawfish. And it has these, <laughs> it has these sayings. That is so handy. And anyway, I've been collecting them for years, giving them out as as presents. Michael Rubenstein and I used to uh, get a big kick out of these, and his brother Ted and I still do. Anyway, I made a talk uh, down in New Iberia, Louisiana, uh, on Thursday night, and I used the Cajun in your pocket as as my little. Show and tell. And I see that it also doubles as a keychain. Correct. Even more handy. Correcto change. <laughs> Very versatile. Of course, it's been in the news, uh, Java. You know, uh, there's some intellectual rights that have been sort of built around the Cajun in your pocket. Yeah, I heard about that, and that's that's kind of odd. I didn't know. I don't know the particulars of the law when it comes to intellectual property and phrases, but apparently um, the inventor. Uh, is staking his claim. Yeah, he's uh, there's a lawsuit against uh, the rapper. Yeah, uh, the rapper Mystical. Mystical. He's a, 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 a legendary uh, New Orleans, Louisiana rapper. And, um, they, yeah, they in some kind of, you know, intellectual property lawsuit. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. So, Kara, what, uh, what you been eating? What you cooking? What's going on in your world? Malcolm, it's been all about the fig. For me, the figs just keep on coming. All right. That's true. We've had so much rain. There have just yeah. been figs everywhere. You know, Kara made a fig cake for us the other day, as you know. I saw that. I saw was that. delish. And uh, my, my great friends, uh, Melissa and David Patterson, have been supplying us with tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and figs. And uh, uh, also, Susan Lyles has been so kind to drop off some bags of tomatoes. It's been a great year. Uh, for successful gardeners, and thankfully they share with people like me who are less than successful, though I did have a good early tomato crop. Yes, you did. But, uh, you know, on the figs, I thought I was just about finished. Um, As you see, I brought you and Java some fig jam, but Mm. I did fig preserves, then I did fig jam. We've had pork tenderloin with figs, done a quail with fig sauce. Oh, John loves the quail now. And yes, he does. And I kept thinking the other figs on our trees are not getting ripe. Lo and behold, what I found out is they are green figs. Oh, my we have goodness. Two different varieties. It's an Italian honey fig. So then I've had to go back and make a whole another round of Green fig. Those preserves. are the big ones, the Italian. Yeah, they're big and they're really, really sweet and just good to eat. Wrapped with prosciutto, stuffed with goat cheese. I have a bush of those in my yard. It's oh. it's immature, but it's uh, it did um, last year. It made yeah. probably three dozen figs is all I had, but they're so large and 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 you're right, they are green. They, they are so they were sweet. Delicious. But anyway, I'm I'm ready for the birds to finish the rest of the figs off. I saw some chatter on coping, cooking and coping uh, about making fig preserves and whether or not to peel the figs in that process. Do you, do you, where do you come down on that? I, I'm a non-peeler. I mean, I think if fig preserves is time-consuming enough if you actually peeled all of the figs, and why? I don't know. It was just it was some, it was some of the talk. It was, maybe it you was know how our people chatter. love to talk. Yes, they do. They love to to share and interact on cooking and coping. How are we doing? Are we gaining? It seems like I'm always approving new members. Well, and you know, as a co-administrator, yeah, I don't know why because nobody has has to gain gain approval, (laughs) but they ask to be approved. But we are growing um, by leaps and bounds, or by 
figs and peaches, <laughs> but uh, I think I checked it this week, and we're at uh, four point four thousand two hundred okay. and ninety. I think right. we, there were three hundred people just during the past month. So people are, are finding it's just a great place to go and hang out and see what other people are doing. Now, this week, this was a good week at my house. Kara made, um, well, she made the fig cake last week. This week she made a toma- two tomato pies that were just fantastic. I posted those on Cooking and Coping. Got a lot of inquiries about the tomato pies. And she also, we talked about this uh, two weeks ago, she also made the cucumber gazpacho that we talked about using that recipe, and it was really, really good. Those were cucumbers that were furnished by the Patterson clan. Well, you know, since you talked to us about that cucumber gazpacho, I have seen uh, mentions just this morning I was looking in Food and Wine magazine for this month, and they had a cucumber gazpacho so it must be a thing. Well, it's tis the season. I mean, everybody's overrun by cucumbers and looking for things to do. I saw a really interesting recipe where you, you thinly shave the cucumber and roll it up uh, um, at sushi style and use the cucumber as the binder, as the wrap. Have you ever is seen the, that? Is the uh, – no. Well – we need to try that. You heard it here on <laughs> Deep South Deep South Dining. What to do with the cucumber. Now, it is back to school time, and a lot of our listeners uh, have little ones, and a lot of our listeners are parents. So, Java, you've been doing a little digging into the old back to school, getting ready uh, for school to start again. Uh, yeah, we're getting we're getting ready for all of our, uh, our little ones to, to make their way back to school uh, in the Jackson Public School area. Uh, next next week, next Monday. So oh, we, how sad! Yeah, for all yeah. Of my, my all of my parents, we said this on another show. Nobody really knows what this time is like unless you are a parent, because it's just another day, another week right. for a lot of people. But Correct. for us parents, we're we're in the thick of it. But I just wanted to say some real quick tips for all of the parents out there because meal time is always a stress for everybody's working, and now back and then you throw back the school back on on top of that time gets tight and nobody wants to eat out of the bag seven days a week (laughs) right it is not healthy no it's it's not healthy it's not what you want to do no matter how many um screams for happy meals that you hear in the back seat but um just (laughs) some uh (laughs) some quick tips that that we use at my house and by no means am i as my family uh, a perfectionist at this but when things are clicking on all cylinders we set a day and time to meal plan each week, which falls on a Sunday. And, uh, you know, we'll figure out what we're going to do all throughout the week. And another thing is set certain days for certain meals. We know on Friday, I don't care unless unless the Almighty comes down. We're having pizza on Friday. Pizza, pizza night, night at your house. <laughs> no matter if we're going to order it. I think it's a universal thing in America. If we're going to order it, we're going to uh, pick it up uh, for frozen pizza, or we're going to make it. If we're going to have pizza on Friday. So that just gets gets you out of your um, out of your uh, head about what you're going to do. And that goes to the next tip. Use your calendar to plan your meals. So Monday, you know, uh, can be one, one uh, dish, and then Tuesday could be Taco Tuesday, Friday is our pizza day, so you just fill in the week as as needed. And then also you want to plan for a leftover night. So on that pot of spaghetti, just plan to do something different um, or use the same ingredients on uh, the next day. So you know, or you, on your pizza. There you go. On I mean, your, your pizza. Bi- meat sauce on your pizza. Yeah. There you go. So plan plan for a leftover night. Um, to keep away from the stress of cooking. Uh, Also, use your time-saving appliances, slow cooker, food processor, Instapot. We are Instapot uh, savvy, slow cooker savvy. Uh, Haven't really got with the food processor, so we have to see what that's about. Be careful there. (laughs) Also, you want to involve the kids. Get the kids involved. So, you know, we may not be getting Happy Meals, but we're going to let you get messy in the kitchen. That's always a, a a good little tip. And the list. Yeah, you wanna you wanna always use a list when you shop uh, and plan around deals. I can go ahead and this is not an endorsement, but this is what we do. We are uh, Kroger click list um, shoppers, and this is what we do each and every week. Put it in the cart, set it, go pick it up around six o'clock, go home, and we have all our groceries for the week. And we have not set foot 
in the grocery store. Have not pushed one buggy. <laughs> well, I mean, that's great, especially with two working parents. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great feature. And and I guess it sort of <clears throat> came to be out of the COVID. Out of, yeah, some good and, things uh, out of the pandemic. Right, right. But Java, I, I just want to say, I mean, I really um, respect the fact that y'all eat together. Yeah. It's a family. Which, and, you know, that's something that we're losing in in our culture that you know, one child wants this, one child wants that. You know, they go to their rooms, they eat at different times, or you know, they eat out of a paper bag at night. And mm-hmm. you know, part of, of being around the the table is not just about the food, but it's about the family unit and it's the time that you have every day that you can look everybody in the eye and say, How was your day? And you know, you pick up on cues and clues from what's really going on in your kid's life yeah, and no, your spouse's life and yeah, it's important true. as much as, as much as i like my goings and comings i do enjoy the end of my day where we are at home and we're sitting around the table um eating a meal so it's it is good times all right we're going to take a break and when we come back we're going to talk about peppers and we're going to talk about coffee and we're going to talk about really anything that our listeners want to talk about because they run the show by Picking up their phones and dialing toll free 1 877 672 7464, and they can ask, they can share, we can start a conversation about most everything. And if you have tips on back to school, we'd love to hear those as well. So, Carol and I'll be right back, and we will talk more about the culture of Southern flavor. Tune in to Deep South Dining here on MPB Think Radio. I'm Java Chapman here with Malcolm White, and we're actually here with Carol Puck. And Malcolm, he stepped out for a minute, and if I was a great producer, I would have planned for it. <laughs> Carol, how are things this morning? Java, everything's just great. I mean, it's rainy, but it's good. And I really enjoyed that conversation about kids and back to school. Yeah, it's always a, a, a real transitional period in households with uh with you know with uh with kids because everybody's still in summer mode and it shows how different you know even with parents we let our hair down everybody stays up a little later we're not so structured on a uh, meal time because we don't have such a you know such a uh, stringent routine but now it's like Kids have to be at school at a certain time. Kids have to be picked up at a certain time. Kids have to do their homework at a certain time. Well, you know, I mean, I I don't have children. And and just something you said made me realize I've never been sympathetic enough when, like, uh, yesterday, one of uh, my partner's daughters couldn't come to She said, oh, it's back to school. I've got so much to do. It's back to school. And, and, you know, I'm thinking, how hard can that be? It must be really, really hard. Because everybody's fluttering around, so... uh, yeah, it's. I mean, you know, everybody has their different situations, but yeah, back to school time is a, a certain period uh, of time where you know us parents and kids need readjusting. Now, if you pro- talk to that same uh, same daughter, uh, maybe about a month from now, two months from now, and everybody's in the groove, then you can, you know, you can find your way back to quote unquote normal life. <laughs> All right. We want to go to the phone call? Let's go to Gussie. Hey, go. Gussie, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Really well. Thanks for calling. What's going on? I see you want to talk about salt. Yeah, about how not to incorporate salt or sugar into your diet. Great tip. Lay it on us. No, I want to ask you the question about how. Oh, you want us to tell you about how to oh, how- reduce <laughs> salt and sugar in your diet. There's one word, two words, herbs and spices. Herbs and spices. Yes. You can get so much flavor in food using herbs and spices. I mean, I grow fresh ones, but lately I've noticed because I've been trying to take the salt out of, like, cooking peas, Mm -hmm. peas and beans, and not putting pork, you know, the salt that's in pork. And I've been using some really great things, even the, like the McCormick Italian spices. 
It doesn't adds, have salt. Adds such a kick. Hmm. I mean, because it's it's oregano, it's basil, it's oh. other Italian spices. <laughs> <laughs> so for salt, you're using uh, Italian spices and fresh herbs. Because a lot of times, what you're you're using salt to lift the flavor right. of a dish. I mean, it just you know it sharpens the flavor of a dish and. That's where herbs and spices can can really come and in. And it would seem sugar would be easier because you've got honey, right? And agave. Agave. And, you know, we, we have products, uh, the stevia, uh, the stevia tree. You have, you know, Truvia, stevia. Those are very popular now because they're natural, not chemical products. Mm-hmm. Okay. Does, is that helpful, Gussie? Yes, it's very helpful. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for listening, thanks and for cer- thanks for calling. And we'll dig into that a little more. Uh, we can. We always love to circle back with questions uh, that our callers pose. Give us a chance to dig a, a little bit deeper into it. And, and just just one more thing. I mean, there are a number of salt substitutes mm-hmm. that you know that are good. A lot of people use something called Mrs. Dash. I love Mrs. Table. Dash. They use it at the table. Kevin Farrell loves Mrs. Dash. He's wow. right here. He, he's he's our call screener today. He also is a great baker. He he provided us with these uh, beautiful peanut cookies. Peanut blossoms. Peanut blossoms. So on Deep South Dining, we don't do all the cooking. Sometimes we just do the eating. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. We appreciate your call again. We appreciate you listening. Uh, we're, we'd love to hear from any of our listeners. Uh, but meanwhile, we're going to talk a little bit about a trip uh, that I took over the week down to uh, New Iberia, Louisiana, which is considered Cajun country. So it's all around the Ashafalaya spillway. And a buddy of mine, Tom, and I went down. I made a talk at the New Iberia Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and while we were there, we, we got to sort of experience the food and culture of that, uh, what we call Cajun country area. And you know, Carol, that's the home of Tabasco, the McElhaney family compound down at Avery Island. It's the home of Cajun Chef. It's the home of Louisiana Hot Sauce and lots of other uh, pepper-related enterprises. Well, I have always wanted to visit Avery Island, so I'm, I'm extremely jealous that you got to make this trip. And I want to hear about it. Well, they've done a magnificent job with the visitor experience. Uh, They have a museum, they have a cafe, they have a self-guided tour where you can go and see the greenhouse operation, the mash operation, the blending operation, and you just move yourself along on this self-guided tour, and you really get a chance to see how this historic uh, process uh, has been uh, shared, how they share it with the public. And then you get to go in the country store, which has just every kind of item you can imagine, including you got to suck the head on them damn crawfish. The Cajun in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they also had a pepper tasting uh, set up. It's a permanent setup in the country store. So I, I mean, Tabasco must have twenty different hot sauces, from habanero to the traditional the. The Family Reserve, which Java we were talking about earlier, which I bought a bottle of. And that green hot sauce. That, the green. Anyway, so um, it's an elaborate setup um, for the and, – and you can – I understand there are cabins close by that you can rent. We didn't do that. We were just day trippers. But it was uh, really eye-opening to see the process. Well, the pepper, of course, that they use is the Tabasco pepper. Right. And – a question I have, do they grow all of those peppers there, or do they buy from other farmers? I asked Where that Where do they come from? Yes. They used to grow them all on the island, but, you know, they ran out of room, and now they literally have farms all up country a little bit, up further north from, from Avery Island. And uh, they were shipping in. We saw, I think it was six or seven container trucks coming in while we were there and I asked the lady what's on the container trucks and she said mash that the, it's it's grown up a little further north ground into the mash pulp and then put in containers and shipped down there to be 
uh, finally prepared for the sauce itself. So I was envision I was envisioning tanker trucks with vinegar to go with the well. With I the think hot they sauce. also bring in the vinegar. You know, they use a lot of vinegar, uh, as you know, to, uh, to to make their hot I, sauces. I think their hot sauces are really in most Louisiana hot sauces are peppers, vinegar, and salt, which is you know different from the thicker. Mexican hot sauces. And Tabasco ages theirs in oak barrels, like wine. Like wine. Mm -hmm. So there is an area you can visit on the tour, uh, and you could actually see uh, that process where they're building the the, uh, the vats. And, and they put a gigantic layer of salt on top to sort of seal in the, the sauce and to keep out any bacteria and any insects. And then they go into this process of aging for five years, 10 years, uh, you know, different ones for different uh, flavors. Okay, well, my last longer. question, because I am fascinated, do they ferment? Um, I mean, do, do they have like big steel tanks? Yes, like, just like, just like wine. A wine. Like a, it, it looks like a winery. It looks, it looked across between a, a brewery and a winery. It, it's, it's very industrial. Um, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's gigantic. Um, but we didn't have time, but I wanted to stop at Louisiana because I know it's a smaller operation, but it's also uh, in that part of the world. But next time we go, we're going to stop at Cajun Chef and at, at Louisiana and get a better look at some of the competition. Malcolm, I did not know that they aged Tabasco in the, in the wood barrels like like whiskey or something like that. Absolutely. And, they, and, I, and I see that, that you can actually buy the wood chips from the barrel. Tabasco, I guess, flavored <laughs> uh, wood chips for your, like your barbecue or something. Like, yes, that's, that's wild. They sell those there on the property and all around town. And in fact, uh, we visited um, a couple in New Iberia who attended the talk, and they had this massive folk art collection. And they invited us to come by the house and see it, and we did. And the guy in his yard had a massive smoking rig, and he talked about. One of his hobbies is, is smoking. And I asked him if he used this uh, Tabasco planks from, from the barrels. And he said he uses it often, and it's really great. So yeah, I, I, can I, I don't know. It's a different type of uh, flavor. And they're, uh, for the people who are asking, they're oak, oak barrels. Right, <laughs> right. That's correct. Well, Malcolm, when I had the Everyday Gourmet cookware store for 30-something years, um, we used to sell a lot of hot sauces, and that was where I first learned about the Scoville scale. And I'm wondering if they talked about that. That's the rating that they use to uh, label how hot sauces. It, 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 it indicates how many times something must be diluted with an equal volume of water until you can't feel the burn Oh no, of, I, I of didn't. The pepper, and and uh, I was reading the hottest hot sauce is one that's rated at sixteen million Scoville units. I I don't want to get no. Uh, I don't want to get anywhere near that. But Tabasco has a rating of twenty five hundred, and it's actually hotter than the other Louisiana. Hot sauces. Yes, and and that's one of the reasons that Tabasco has never been my favorite. Uh, Crystal is my favorite, but I found in my tasting experience uh, at the at the Tabasco place that they have a uh, a family reserve, uh, which I had never seen before. They don't sell it in stores, and it is aged I think eight years, and it was sweeter and less hot, and I really loved it and bought a bottle, and I can't wait to. Mm -hmm to experiment with it using crystal and, and this family reserve and seeing which one I, I like the best. But I'm not into heat uh, yeah. in, in terms of pain. <laughs> but so many people are, but the world's hottest hot sauce that you can buy commercially is called Mad Dog 357 Plutonium 9. Oh, and what? it is. <laughs> And it is <laughs> nine million, nine million Scoville units. So think about nine million versus twenty five hundred for Tabasco. It just and there are people, there are people that do this. There are there are are contests all over the world, all over the world. Well, 
I have friends who love that stuff, and they grow these ghost peppers, and they make their own, and it's just like I can't even touch it. Well, I mean, I, I grew some cayenne peppers this year, and I decided I was going to experiment with using one of the peppers. I mentioned it in an earlier show where I cut it open, took the seeds out, and put the pepper down inside of a, a sweet potato and baked it without the without the seeds and it was terrific but when i was cleaning the thing i couldn't get the fire off of my hands it took like two days i was touching my lips it was awful i'd touch my nose and i would forget and and i washed and i washed it i don't know how people uh, deal with all that kind of heat well i mean one one great tip is when you're handling peppers especially the hot peppers to use gloves Hmm. and you know i always immediately slice down the pepper and scrape out the seeds yeah. because yeah the seeds are where the where the heat is it's where but the you pain really is. have to be careful with what'd you call the scale the scoville that's scale. where the seeds are that's where, are where the that's scoville. where the pain is but you know when when i knew we were going to talk about this i was looking up the world calendar of hot sauce festivals because i thought you know mal and i have not been on a culinary road trip in a long time and you know we we're in Ireland one one time. We went to yes, we were. Scotland one time. I was thinking, what about what we could go to a festival? And literally, they have them in England, in Manila, Philippines, uh, lots of them in Australia. So you could literally go around the world. Hungary, we could just pick one. Hmm. But the problem is, I think neither of us really... When, it's not our it's, thing. <laughs> it's, it's not our thing. <laughs> now, you brought this beautiful book over here with all of these illustrations of peppers in it. What you got yeah, there? I kind of got fired up Show last, and tell. last night. But uh, this is a book I had when I was at the Everyday Gourmet from the early 80s. And it, it's by a, a professor named Gene Andrews. But I know that radio is the medium of voice, not look. But I just wanted wanted you to see how... We can go and look at all the plates. Wow, and those illust- are really great illustrations. illustrations. These are like the old timey mm-hmm. botanical plates. <clears throat> uh, but the first thing I learned in this book is Christopher Columbus was the first one to document the pepper from his voyages to the New World. Really? Yes, you heard it here on Deep South Dining. And by document, he just sort of made notes of when he would come across new peppers or. Well, or, or cultures he, that, uh, well, that he, ate you know, peppers. He, he documented the e- existence of it and what it was. You know, some people used to say, "Well, Christopher Columbus discovered the pepper." Well, he didn't really discover anything. He <laughs> discovered it for for himself because many uh, American Central Americans and South Americans were growing and using mm. peppers, and he introduced them to his part of the world and documented the uses that that he found. Here's a pepper question for you. In this part of the world, a lot of people love pepper jelly and make pepper jelly. What peppers are typically used in pepper jelly? I've never made made pepper jelly. I haven't either, and I don't know. I'll have to look up the answer to that question. We stumped ourselves. We we, we, we stumped ourselves. I mean, we can uh, talk about chili rellenos and... Okay. Well, let's take a break, and we will try to figure out what peppers are used in pepper jelly. And if you know the answer to that question, you can certainly chime in by calling toll-free 1-877-672-7464, and we can talk more about peppers. I want to talk a little bit about coffee when we come back. Uh, I stumbled into a couple of new coffees uh, over the weekend, so uh, I'm excited about that. So Carol and I will be right back. Here on MPB Think Radio, this is Deep South Dining. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing a doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. Welcome back to Deep South Dining, where we are getting ready. 
Are you ready? Yes, Kirk? we are. Bring a little Louisiana bounce into the uh, show since we're talking all this Louisiana and the hot sauce. And who are you featuring here, DJ? Uh, that's uh, DJ Jubilee. He's a New Orleans bounce <laughs> music legend. What is bounce music? Bounce music is an original uh, New Orleans form of music, and of course, um, it just has this that that rhythm and that bounce. I wish I could articulate it better, but it's strictly New Orleans, and it's unmistakable. I got the bounce. <laughs> unmistakable when you hear. It. Is it like being in a car that bounces? No, well, no. it's it's kind of a uh, that goes with the dance. It's a okay. lot of twerking that happens when. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there you have it. Well, welcome back to Deep South Dining. Carol and I are here. We'd love to hear from you if you have a question. You want to talk about figs? You want to talk about? Squash, tomatoes, or peppers. if you want to talk about pepper jelly. And over the break, we we Carol did some research on the pepper jelly yes, question we did. that and we stumped we, ourselves on. And we, Malcolm and Carol, will be making pepper jelly this fall. You know, it's a shame neither one of us have have done that. I know our education is not complete. So what? Peppers are typically used in pepper jelly, Carol. Well, the the answer is you can use about anything you want. Mm. But uh, for a southern pepper jelly, it's normally uh, red and green bell peppers and then habaneros for the heat. And you can make it as hot or sweet as you like. You can use whatever pepper you want instead of the habanero, but... At your own risk. Yes, yes. Be very careful there. So uh, this past week, actually past two weeks, I was introduced to two new coffees. Now, I am a coffee lover, coffee snob. Um, You know, I like coffee and chicory, and I like it served Olay style, which is about a third to a half milk, cream, whatever you want to use. You're nodding your head. Love it. Hold yeah. on. So, Malcolm, you're, you're a coffee snob, so Starbucks gift cards do nothing for you. You know, I won't turn them down, and I won't embarrass myself, but I, I'm not a huge Starbucks uh, say, fan. Say it like a true coffee snob. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> again, I love the coffee and chicory, and they don't do that at Starbucks, uh, or if they do, I've never seen it. Okay. All right. So, um I love the Cafe Du Monde. That's my favorite version, and that's the one that most people know. They go to New Orleans. They go eat some beignets. They go to Cafe Du Monde, whether it's out in Metairie or if it's in the French Quarter, and they have probably for the first time in their life uh, a Cafe uh, a cafe Au Lait. It's, they, they warm the milk and, and put it into the uh, coffee chicory. Um, and and in its um, it's their own blend of coffee. It's it's the Cafe Du Monde blend, and that's what I that's my favorite. Now it's not to say that I don't like other coffees, but uh, a week before last, I went to a friend's house for dinner. M- one of my oldest childhood friends, uh, Cynthia uh, and Kent Miller, have moved to Jackson, um, and we grew up uh, in Stone County together. But they they moved here, so we went over and had dinner with them. And Kara cooked a cake. I think we had an apple cake. But Kent pulled out and said, anybody want coffee? And he pulled out a coffee, and he served it, and it was terrific. And I said, what is it? And he said, it is Union, Union brand coffee. Carol, have you ever heard of that? I have not. It's a part of the uh, French market brand, but it is their coffee chicory. And it was really good, and I enjoyed it very much. And then, lo and behold, when I was in New Iberia, on Thursday, and the little B and B where I was staying, they had a a bag of coffee that I'd never had before called Mellow Joy M E L L O Mellow Joy, and that coffee is uh, roasted and bagged and manufactured uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana. Well, I'm glad to to hear all of this, and I would really love to have a show on coffee and. You know, I think we need to talk more about chicory because, you know, a lot of people, <clears throat> especially younger people who have grown up in the Starbucks generation, have right. never had the joy of coffee and chicory. Well, we'll we'll spend at least a segment on it coming yeah. up. Uh, and, and I believe... Chicory, is, it's a ground root, and we need to look into why New Orleans 
kind of became the center of that. I mean, it was used in colonial America, but it, it stuck in New Orleans because New Orleans people love their traditions. Yeah, I think it was originally used as an extender, right. a way during really economic hard times to stretch the coffee. And then people really got interested in the flavor and got fond of it, became fond of it. And then it became, it, it went, uh, you know, from an extender to an art form and, and lots of people uh, begin now. I believe, and I could be wrong. I believe that people are just as f- fiercely loyal to their coffee brands as they are their mayonnaise brands. I believe you're right. Now we've never had any post on cooking and coping or anybody call in that did not have a well developed opinion about mayonnaise. Well developed. Well, I learned this. Uh, having the everyday gourmet, you know, we opened in 1981, and this was before you could get coffee beans, you mm-hmm. know, fresh roasted coffee beans here. <clears throat> and there were certain coffees that we could never be out of because people would, you know, have fire in their eyes and be going through with withdrawal. And I remember that was Kenya Double A, Costa Rica, and, and Guatemala. And you don't mess around with those people. Uh-huh. And you really don't mess around with French roast people <clears throat> because that is a dark, strong roast. And you don't want to say to anybody, I am so sorry, sir or ma'am, we are out of that coffee because they are liable to grab you by the <laughs> shoulders and shake you. <laughs> you know, Cuban coffee is amazing. Uh, uh, and Vietnamese coffee is, is terrific. I learned about it when I was living in New Orleans and. But anyway, there are lots and lots of different ways to consume coffee, and it is. It, I would be be interested to see the numbers on how much coffee uh, is consumed uh, globally and in this country. And, and I think you know, sort of, it is an important uh, part of the culinary experience. So we'll talk more about coffee uh, coming up. But meanwhile, we've got a caller on the phone. Uh, we've got Joe calling us from Oxford, Mississippi. Hey, Joe, how you doing, man? Doing well. How are y'all? Terrific. We're, we're doing great. Are you, are you Joe of the dried figs? Yes. The fig vodka. Yes. Fig yes. Vodka. The the fig vodka. It was funny because the the weekend after after you called into the radio show, I just happened to be in Oxford and was at one of your fine restaurants where they had a great bar. And I asked the bartender. I said, Do you know? A, Somebody named Joe. Does he work work here? That's really great. Talking about fig vodka. Oh well, uh, we're on a grit in Taylor, Mississippi. Actually, oh, oh you there, live in the uh, suburbs. Oh, I live in Oxford, but I commute to work to Taylor. Oh, you uh, work at Grit. Yes, I work at Grit. In Taylor. Okay, and for people who don't know, tell us about Grit. It's a great restaurant out in Taylor. Oh, it is. It is. So it's um, really good takes on classic dishes. Uh, southern versions of all kinds of weird and wacky cool things like uh, marinated and brined pork shoulder steaks is an example mm. where you wouldn't normally want to cook that you know medium well. You'd want to have it smoked or pulled pork, but we somehow managed to do it where it's tender and flavorful with a sushi rice salad. It's good stuff. Yikes, that it's sounds delicious. Mm-hmm. But I want to call out and tell you all about some pepper jelly or talk about it for a second. Yeah, man, right. put it on Thank us. Thank you. We, so, we embarrassed uh, ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You were exactly right. You can use any pepper that you want. But I was going to suggest to anybody trying it, if you look up a recipe online, it's going to try to tell you to can it, you know, preserve it in jars. And you don't have to. As long as you use it within a month, you'll be fine. So you just stay in the fridge if you don't have all the stuff to can uh, jars with. So don't let it turn you off to making your own pepper jelly at home because, oh, I don't have a big pot that I can water bath these in. I don't have a, a jar. I don't have, like, the canning funnels. You don't need all that. You can put it in a core container or you can put it in a Tupperware. Just use it within a month and keep it in the fridge. What are your favorite things to use pepper jelly with? Fried chicken's really good. You can put it on a fried chicken sandwich. Mm. Um, you can take a wheel of brie. And using some string, cut it in half, and then stuff the brie with pepper jelly. That's another good one. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll tell you a weird one I've done before is doing like a crouton with pimento cheese, 
on it, good pimento cheese, and then putting just a little drop of pepper jelly on the top. It, it, it that's really good. Yeah. That sounds great. Doesn't sound weird at all to me. Oh, good. No, that's not weird at all. Mm. Uh, cream cheese on a cracker with pepper jelly is really good. That's sort of an old school one, you know, growing oh, yeah. up. I remember that's sort of one of the ways I would see pepper jelly as, as a kid. Mm-hmm. On cream yeah, cheese. a block of cream cheese, pepper jelly. It was like the deep south hors d'oeuvre right. of, the, <laughs> Standard. of the 50s and 60s. <laughs> right. But a good one, tried and true. Mm-hmm. And even even uh, just making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with pepper jelly makes it a little different, you know. Oh man! Oh, what what up. about pork? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've I've never done it with pork, but I don't see it being bad. Maybe a pork tenderloin. Mm-hmm. You can braise yeah. it with some apples, like apples and apple juice, and then pull it out and top it with pepper jelly. Because most pepper jelly recipes use apple cider vinegar anyway. Right. Uh, I also wanted to say something about chicory for those of age that like the chicory flavor and like coffee there's a uh liqueur called hoodoo that's a chicory liqueur it's really good mixed in with iced coffee wow so let's see i think it's a mississippi product i'm just gonna look at the bottle real quick. okay uh, hoodoo hoodoo chicory <laughs> liqueur where are you made it's made in jackson mississippi oh, there you go it is. Great. bottled by Bottle Tree Beverage Company, Jackson, Mississippi. Bottle Tree Beverage Company. We're on it. We're on them. Yeah. We're going to yeah. check that out. Sounds like a little niche operation that we need to know about. We appreciate you sharing that really with good. us, Joe. Yes, sir. Of course. And thank you. I really appreciate you all, and I love your show. Thanks, yeah, sir. Yeah, and Joe, you've added a lot. Call in often. I will. <laughs> All right, well, let's stay in Oxford. While we're there, we've got another caller uh, from Oxford calling. Uh, Chico is on the phone. What's going on, Chico? Well, maybe maybe he's not there yet. Almost. I got a comment about, Go about Joe, though, because um, Joe is going to become the third wheel on this show if he's not uh, careful. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he's he's called in twice and, uh, and hipped us to some really, really good things. And they're both um, with the fig, vodka, and this uh, chicory liqueur. They're right up my alley. <laughs> well, let's right. talk to Chico now. All right. Hey, Chico. What's happening, brother? Hey, now. Where you at? I'm calling with good news from Tupelo. Oh, man. i always excited about some good news from Tupelo. <laughs> well, I um, am I on the air. Yes, you are. Oh, okay, I could I couldn't tell. There was a little flub there. Um, so here's what I got. Um, there's a new, you know, like a lot of us. I'm a local guy when it comes to grocery stores. Mm-hmm. Big store like Larson's Big Store in Oxford, or Todd's Big Store in Tupelo, and a new local place opened up in Tupelo called Brooks Grocery been meaning to check it out and i went there this morning and the good news is is that unlike at kroger or walmart my little arm held radio will pick up inside there so i could walk around and they're listening to you oh i'm i'm out nerding java (laughs) (laughs) you can't out nerd java that was pretty that was pretty good chico it was pretty close (laughs) I, i i got through there and i went down the road to one of my favorite kind of grocery stores the Silver Dollar, which has um, all kinds of crazy stuff from all over the country, stuff that they can't sell anywhere else, and it's real cheap. And uh, I love stores like that. There, there's one close to Yankee Stadium that's just, you know, just wonderful. Anytime Ginger and I go up there to see the Bronx Bombers, we go to that supermarket, just walk around and see all the cool stuff. So this morning at Silver Dollar, I'm walking around, and I, I passed, the spray duck fat uh, you know it was, a, it was a cool can of spray and, duck it, fat it, duck can, duck fat in a spray can yeah my goodness yeah and um but i did have if you've ever had milton's crackers the california company and the crackers are baked in canada and i can't say enough good things about them i mm-hmm. get them at kroger and they had them here at silver dollar this morning for just 50 cents a box and they weren't even expired. <laughs> well, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, some of the stuff in there is expired. And oh, I still okay. buy it anyway. But well, just the good to know I you're roaming to... around out there on our behalf. <laughs> the, the thing that I did buy 
that uh, I didn't even check to see if it was expired, and I cannot wait to try it. And I'll get back to y'all on what it is. Uh, from the Serious Bean Company, brand mm. beans, and they're Dr. Pepper flavored. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah we're going to need a full report on that. Okay, well, I'm going to go home and get to work on it. Chico Harris from Oxford, Mississippi. Thank we you. always appreciate you listening and calling in. We got another caller from Covington, Louisiana. Polly is on the line. Hello, Polly. Hey, how you doing? Real good. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Just enjoying listening to the program, and I wanted to make a comment about pepper jelly. What I do with it? Great. I I brush it on duck breasts and oh. and grill it. Put it on the grill. And it kind of caramelizes and just gives it a little zing. And that's the only way I do my duck breast. That is a terrific tip. Yeah, yeah. You, now, do you you go out and gather those ducks yourself? Or do you have someone in your family who's a duck yeah, hunter? Or so, do you have a yeah. friend that supplies the ducks? All of the above, except going out myself. But I have friends and family that uh, grace me with those beautiful creatures. <laughs> And so you have a freezer full of duck breasts, is what you're telling us. Usually, yeah. Yeah, I've got a good supply. I, I am just, my, my mind is just going in circles thinking about all these pepper jelly things. I bet duck poppers mm. would be Ooh. delicious dipped in a little pepper jelly. Yeah, with, with that, there you go. Is that the one that's bacon wrapped? Yeah, this, with that that, yeah bacon salty, wrapped with the, and crunchy. with a little pepper in it. Ooh. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Malcolm, we got to get cooking. we got to get going here. <laughs> Yeah. We'll give it a try. Thank you, Polly, from Covington, uh, for listening and for calling in. We have uh, one of our listeners has just uh, sent us, oh, I don't know where it went. Well, I, I accidentally oh, here it got is. it off the screen. Amanda Anglin, uh, uh, she says that uh, she's a native of Baton Rouge, so Community Coffee's breakfast roast is her favorite. But a trip last year to the Gulf Coast, I found Coast Roast. Super local Mississippi roasted beans, and she said they were just terrific. On the topic of pepper jelly, Amanda shares with us that she uses banana peppers with one chopped jalapeno and pimento peppers and follow the direction, she says, uh, on the Sure-Gel box. So there you go. We appreciate callers who call in. We appreciate folks that send us an email. And this... Uh, Information actually came in through our cooking and coping site, Carol. That's great, Mal. Um, enough about peppers. I have a question that I forgot to ask you. Oh, sure. We got diverted by yeah, Avery Allen. <laughs> I'm not interested in crawfish. I want to know, <laughs> did you eat boudin in southern Louisiana? Well, let me say this about boudin. Like Starbucks, I'm not a big fan. I have certainly eaten boudin and fair amount of it. It's not something I pull over on the side of the road when I see a sign and, and experiment with. But I will tell you this, driving through Cajun country, which is what I've done last Thursday and Friday, you will see signs everywhere, grocery stores, uh, little shacks on the side of the road, little mom-and-pop operations. Gas stations. Selling the boudin. Also, crawfish. There is crawfish for sale at every intersection. Crabs. Signs everywhere. Fresh crabs. you got to realize how close New Iberia is to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that part of the world, you know, is virtually underwater. So shrimps, crabs, crawfish, Boudin is just an item that is very popular in that part of the world. And and boudin, uh, uh, for those who have not uh, had the joy of eating boudin before, it's in a casing. It's pork. It's cooked rice. It's seasonings. It differs from one cook to the other. Uh, you pulverize it in a grinder and then put it in sausage casings. And boudin balls are fried boudin balls. That's a big deal, too. Absolutely. Well, Carol, it's certainly been fun. Another hour of Deep South Dining right here. We are a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by generous contributions from listeners like yourself. Thank you. 
Our show is produced by Java Chapman. For my co-host, Carol Puckett, I'm Malcolm White. Please stay tuned now for Marshall Ramsey's show, Now You're Talking, followed by Southern Remedy at 11 a.m. And we ask that you join us next Monday right here for more Deep South Dining, heard only on MPB Think Radio. Thank you.